Hello everyone, welcome to another video of Circuit Digest. In this video, we'll show you how you can build your very own SMPS circuit like this one over here. So this particular SMPS circuit could take an AC mains voltage from your power socket through these two pins and provide a 12 volt DC power through these two pins. So the SMPS is rated for 15 watts power, meaning it can give you 12 volt DC output with a maximum current rating of 1.25 amps. So an SMPS circuit like this will be very useful when you are building your own power modules to power a power hungry project say like a 3D printer or a CNC plotter. You can also use this as the basics of building your very own charger for charging your lithium or lead acid batteries. So without any further ado, let's get into the project. As few people might have already recognized from this flyback transformer, the complete circuit is based on a flyback topology with the TNY268PN as the heart of its circuit. So as you can see here, this is the TNY268PN SMPS controller IC from a company called Power Integrations. So this IC basically switches the transformer to convert your AC mains voltage to 12 volt or whatever voltage is required according to your needs. But if that is the case, what is the purpose of all these extra components? What are they doing on the circuit? To make things clear, let's take a look at the circuit diagram. So the complete circuit diagram for you is shown over here. To explain things, let's start from the input section. So this board not only converts blindly converts your AC voltage to 12 volt DC, but it also has some protection features which I will be explaining as we go through the circuit. So let's start from the input side. So as you can see here, on the input side, we have the AC input voltage, which is the line and neutral of your power socket, which then goes through a fuse and a MOV. MOV stands for metal oxide wave resistor. So these two circuits together form the input surge and fault protection. So basically what happens is whenever there is an over voltage, this MOV forms a short and thus increasing the current flowing through this loop. In that case, this fuse, which is a slow blow fuse, will blow off and protect your circuit from getting affected by this over voltage. And then moving on, we have the AC to DC conversion part over here, which is done using the BD, sorry, DB107 diode bridge, as you can see here. So let's also look into the board so that we get to know what's actually happening. So as you can see here, these are the AC input pins, which then moves on to a slow blow fuse which is this black color thing and then we have an MOV in parallel with that a metal oxide varistor in parallel with that which these three components form the input surge and fault protection from there we are moving on to the AC to DC conversion which is done by this particular IC DB107 which is this one if you take a close look at the IC you can notice that it has sine wave symbol here indicating that it takes an AC input voltage and a positive and negative here to indicate that it's giving a DC voltage. So then this DC voltage is taken to a filter. So this filter is called a Pi filter. The reason for calling it as a Pi filter is that as you can see we have a capacitor, an inductor and another capacitor over here which forms something like this. So if you take if you take a look at the structure, it looks like the symbol pi. So that's the reason this is called a pi filter, but it's basically two capacitors and an inductor. So if you take a look at our circuit, we have the two capacitors over here and the inductor, which is an AC line choke. So this is the inductor, as you can see here, it has four terminals, it has four terminals. So we have those two capacitors and the inductor over here. Then moving on from the capacitor section, we have the switching circuit. So as I told you earlier, the TNY268PN is the main switching IC and the brain behind this controller. So this IC is located over here as I showed you earlier. This is our 
spraying of the circuit and it also has a capacitor C3 which you can see here and then moving on here we have the diodes D1 and D2 which together forms a clamping circuit so as we know we will be switching the primary side of the transformer and whenever the primary side is switched off the transformer being an inductor would pump in some reverse voltage back into the circuit this reverse voltage should not affect our controller IC and hence we use a clipping circuit to sorry a clamping circuit to clamp the excess voltage that might enter into our TNY268 IC now uh, the diodes D1 and D2 can be found over here as you can see this is D2 and D1 is sitting inside the part number of the diodes can be seen over here and then proceeding with our circuit diagram we have the resistors R1 and R2 over here R1 and R2 which is 1 mega ohm each which is used to give under voltage lockout protection to our IC and then we have a capacitor C4 connected to the transformer mm, let's find that out yeah we have a C4 over here as you can see we have a capacitor that's connected between the transformer and the ground and then moving on to understand the complete working of the circuit we not only have to look at the TNY268 PN IC but also two other important ICs which is the PC817 and the TL431 voltage reference IC so what has happened so far is that we have received the 240 volt AC and has converted into DC which would be approximately 325 volts. Now this 325 volts has to be switched by a power management IC to get our required 12 volts. So we will get our required 12 volts on the secondary side of the transformer. Now this IC should need a feedback to know what's happening on the secondary side and that feedback is provided by an optocoupler called PC817. So as you can see here the optocoupler has a diode inside which emits light and there is a phototransistor which responds to this light and based on this signal the power management IC will control its switching speed to provide the required voltage on the output side. So the feedback is taken from the output side as you can see here and we have another label called output which is shown over here. So this output uses a reference uh, reference voltage IC called TL431. So if you want more details on how to select the values of this resistor and more details on what exactly is happening here, you might want to check at the link, check the link given at the description of this video. So let's proceed with the circuit diagram and then we have the output side over here which has an LC filter and a scotchy diode over here whose part number is SR360 and we also have an LC filter to filter out any ripples on the output side. So that's it guys this is pretty much it so the circuit diagram is uh, pretty much obvious uh, if you are still confused and if you need more details I'm sure you will find all the required information along with the circuit diagram and the part numbers the BOM everything can be found at the link given in the description of this video. So once we are ready with the circuit diagram, it's time to proceed with fabricating our PCB. Now unlike other boards, this PCB requires some special attention because it is an SMPS circuit. So as you can see here, this is the top layer and this is the bottom layer and we have used a single side layer but this is not a double side board this is just a single side board as you can see the tracks are available only at the bottom of the PCB this is because since it's an SMPS circuit most most people will prefer only the tracks on the bottom side to avoid any interference and another thing that you should notice is that the isolation provided between the transformers and the main power section so as I told you earlier here is where you give your 230 volt AC input and it gets converted to DC over here and there is a very good possibility that this conversion might affect the switching circuit over here so we have provided slots to isolate this power section from the switching section so as you can see this is our switching section and there is a slot over here there is a slot over here to isolate the circuitry from the switching side so with these design considerations in mind you can proceed with altering the circuit diagram as required for your application and you can proceed with designing your own PCBs 
The Gerber file for this exact same PCB can be found on our website for your reference. People who are not into PCB designing can download the Gerber file and directly hand it over to your PCB fabricator to get your boards done. When it comes to PCB fabrication, we always prefer PCBGoGo.com who are not only the manufacturers of these boards but are also the sponsors for this video. PCBGoGo is a professional PCB prototype, assembly and layout service providers who are highly specialized in quick turn prototype for low and medium volumes. So let's take a look at PCBGoGo first. So you can just open your browser and get into their website. Just wait a second. So this is their website which is PCBGoGo.com and once you get into it you will be taken to their home page which looks something like this. So once you get into it, make sure that you have signed in. I have already signed in since I have been using it for a long time. But if you are a new user, you can sign up and every new user gets 20% discount on their first order. So once you get into their website, you can enter a few basic details of your PCB like your length of the PCB and the width of the PCB. Assuming it is 100 mm cross 100 mm. So let's enter 100 and 100 over here and the quantity the minimum would be 5 so let's select 5 and I need a 2 layer PCB with 1.6 mm thickness. So once you enter these basic details you can click on quote now which will take you to another page which will have more details about your PCB. So by default you can leave all these values to the default thing. On the right side there is something interesting. So as I change the parameters on the left side, as I change these parameters, you'll notice that the build time and the price of the PCB gets updated. For example, for this particular settings, they will require three to four days to fabricate our PCB, which is the build time. And the shipping charge would be around $21 if I choose DHL. If I choose China Post, it would further go down to $9. So let's choose China Post and scroll further down where you will see the complete cost required to fabricate your PCB which is $14. Let's click on add to basket and proceed to the next page where you will be asked to enter the Gerber file that we downloaded. So once it's get uploaded, they will take few minutes to verify your Gerber file and once that is done, you can proceed with submit order now button and it will take some time for them to fabricate your PCB. And here we go. Here is the box that I told you earlier. As you can see, it says China Post. So let me open it with my scoring date here. So once you get your PCB, you can proceed with assembling then, which will result in a board similar to this. Now the components on these boards are commonly available except for these flyback transformer and these capacitors. So the capacitor is from Worth Electronics, again the part number and the complete BOEM for this circuit can be found on our website. You might struggle a bit finding the right uh, flyback transformer and the capacitor and when it comes to an SMPS circuit the transformer is the vital part which decides the performance of the circuit. So maybe in future we'll also write an article on how to design your own flyback transformer by doing your own windings so that you don't have to worry about selecting the right transformer or finding the right vendor for your SMPS circuit. For now you can either salvage it from your old 12 volt adapters or from your other SMPS circuits and make sure that it can work on your circuit. And again the information of the transformer can also be found on our website. Once you have assembled the circuit we can proceed with testing it. So let's take this board to a lab setup, connect it to a variac, connect it to a load machine and check how it performs. We'll also be measuring the ripple voltage of this board to see how it reacts to the different input voltage and output current consumption. Okay, now we have got a board over here and we have made a setup to check how the board is actually working. So as you can see here, we have connected the input voltage and we are also monitoring the output voltage. We have an oscilloscope here whose screen is damaged. So instead of using this screen, we'll be using our laptop screen over here to measure the ripple voltage from our SMPS circuit. On the left side, you can see a variac which is currently at zero. As you can see on the multimeter, it shows 003 volt AC and the multimeter's probe is connected to the variac. So, so whatever the voltage is set on the variac can be seen on the multimeter. And it's connected to the input and the output is connected to a variable load 
as you can see here we have a potentiometer to vary the load and this actually works with the MOSFET over here the MOSFET controls the current that flows through the load so we can set the output current and monitor how our SMPS circuit is working so this multimeter shows the output voltage which is connected to the output side of the SMPS circuit and there is also a capacitor as you can see here which is used to measure the ripple voltage and the oscilloscope's probe is also connected over here as you can see so now to begin our setup let's increase the voltage so as i told you earlier so the load is zero and to increase the voltage we can even start with 90 volts which is the minimum voltage required for our smps as you can see here even at 82 volts the output has started glowing so let's set it at 90 and if you look at the output side we are getting 12 volt dc volt on the output and this load machine over here displays the voltage and the current which is 70 milliamps currently so the 70 milliamps is consumed because of the circuitry and the seven segment display so as you can see here it is 90 volt input and we are getting a 12 volt output with 70 milliamps current consumption now to measure the ripple voltage we can look at the oscilloscope waveform let me adjust the time division and once we adjust the time division if you look at our scale we have we have a scale of 100 microseconds and 10 millivolts so with that scale if you look at the waveform you can see that the ripple voltage is somewhere around 10 millivolts so it's actually lesser than that but you can consider it since 10 millivolts a single division you can see that the maximum peak to peak ripple voltage is only 10 millivolts so here you can see these long stripe lines which are actually the noise so we should ignore them so the circuit is working at 125 kilohertz switching frequency which is the same waveform you can see here the small triangle things are the ripple voltages and for a good SMPS circuit the ripple voltage should be as low as possible so here we have a 10 millivolt as ripple voltage with a current consumption of 70 milliamps and a voltage of 12.08 volts and do remember that the input voltage is 90 volt AC till now so now let's increase the current value the maximum that our SMPS circuit could handle is 1.25 amps that is 15 watts of power at 12 volts so let's set it at 1 amps over here as you can see it's almost 1.16 1.18 1 1.2 so the maximum is 1.25 but let's set it at 1.21 for now which is almost the full load current so at the full load current you can notice that the voltage has dropped slightly which is expectable for an smps circuit so at that voltage you can see the ripple has actually increased now so it is about 20 millivolts peak to peak right now and the ripple voltage has actually increased because of the maximum current that we are drawing out of the SMPS circuit. So when you're operating at the full load power, then you can expect the ripple voltage to increase and the input voltage is still 90 volts. So this is the worst case scenario. The ripple voltage will be maximum when you're using the SMPS circuit to its full potential. Now let's increase the input voltage to our standard mains voltage, which is 230 volts here in India. So now the input voltage is set to 230 volts and the output current is 1.21. Let's actually increase it and uh, the voltage is to 11.9. So let's actually increase the load current to the maximum potential, which is 1.25 as the rated current. So it's 1.25 and the voltage is 11.9 volts. The output voltage is 11.9 volts. So here, as you can see, the ripple is at its maximum. So we are operating at the full load input voltage and a full load output current with an output voltage of 11.9 volt and the ripple here is almost 30 millivolts peak to peak. So that is it guys. This is how you build your very own SMPS circuit. Hope you enjoyed the video and learned something useful out of it. Please consider subscribing to Circuit Digest if you have enjoyed watching the video and I will meet you again with another interesting video. Thank you.